and 10. A lot of you have heard my story already, so I have done switched it up. <laughs> Can't keep giving you the same thing over and over and over again. So well, the one thing that y'all need to know about me is that my life was a shit show prior to the drugs and the alcohol kicking in. Like a shit show even before I was born. I was destined to become an alcoholic and an addict. You know, my mother, my biological mother, decided at some point between five and a half and six months pregnant that she didn't want to be pregnant anymore. And it was before Roe versus Wade became legal. So she swallowed a bottle full of pills and she threw herself down the flight of stairs. She wasn't expecting me to be a fighter. So then she gave me up for adoption. Now my adopted mother was my biggest and my worst bully. She always let me know that I didn't matter. Um, and that I didn't mean anything to her. You know, my mother adopted four kids, and I do not believe that she adopted kids because she had this overwhelming desire to be a mother. She adopted kids because she wanted the world to think that she was a perfect parent. You know, that's the way, that's just really the way she was. And my youngest memory of uh, things that she would put me through, I was two. And she used to tie me to the bed so that I wouldn't go roaming around the house in the middle of the night. Um, and that's how my life started. So my life really was a shit show. <laughs> Way before the drugs. The drugs and the alcohol just made it easier to deal with. You know what I'm saying? She used to point me off on parents, godparents, uh, grandparents, aunts, uncles on the weekends just because she needed a break from me. And this really wasn't because I was a bad kid. It was just, I didn't fit into her little mold of what the perfect family was supposed to be like. You know, I was different. I wanted to play in the dirt and, and, and do all those crazy shits and whatnot. I wasn't this little curtsying little female who wore patent leather shoes and socks. No, that was never me. Um, but when I was about nine years old, she needed some place to put me that would keep me more than a weekend. And she found the place. But in order to put me there, we had to go through the court system. <laughs> so she had me deemed incorrigible at nine. I don't think I reached incorrigible until I was about at least 13. <laughs> Wasn't incorrigible at nine. Um, and this place became a second, uh, a second home to me. You know, it's where I learned how to fight. It's where I learned about the streets. It's where, this little nine-year-old learned everything that a little nine-year-old should not be supposed to learn. You know what I'm saying? Um, but it became a home away from home because every time they let me out, eventually they would have to let me out. Um, she would find a way to put me back in. And it got so bad that as I was coming down the stairs to leave, I'd look at the council and say, bye, see you in a few weeks, because I usually would, because she'd put me right back in. Um, when I was 12, this was one of those such times that I was back in, and for whatever reason, these people decided to give me a roommate who was just as rebellious as my ass was. <coughs> Why they thought that was a good idea, I have no idea. Because by then, I was probably a little incorrigible. You know what I'm saying? And we just felt like, pretty much like people when they go into rehab, you know, these people don't know me, they don't understand me, they don't know what's best for me, blah, 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 blah. So we decided we were going to go AWOL. Only we couldn't walk out the front door. That was not permitted. So we took the bed sheets and we ripped them up. And we braided them. We tied them to the radiator and uh, out the second store window we went. <laughs> We was bound and determined to get out that bitch for real. <laughs> and this was more or less her neck of the woods, so wherever she led, I followed. You know, in my head, I was free. I had no adults around to tell me to, to do, they couldn't tell me shit. So this is the way this was supposed to be. And we ended up hanging out on the block with her boyfriend and all her little boyfriend's friends, and, and it ended up being like a block party. Ooh. You know, there was people blasting music from the third or the fourth floor walk up. And um, there were people playing bones, spades, and dancing in the middle of the streets. And I'm like, yes, this is 
what my life is supposed to be. And it pretty much set the precedent on how my life ended up. Uh, but as night fell, we went back to her boyfriend's house. And I really wasn't paying much attention back then, but looking back at it, she was only a couple of years older than me, so 12, 13, she was about maybe 14. He was in his mid-20s, and yeah. I wasn't even, you know, that, that didn't even snap into my head. But I swear to God, I was grown, you couldn't tell me shit. So this was back in the 80s, and I'm looking around the room, and there are a lot of young, little young women in here, so y'all may not understand this. But back where I'm from, I don't care where you went in the hood, there was always a dresser in the living room with a big ass TV sitting on top of it, mm -hmm. with the wire hanger for reception, mm -hmm. and the pliers to turn the chest. Yep. Didn't matter where you were in the hood, but that's what you got. And at the stroke of midnight, it's not like it is today where you can literally watch TV all night long. Back then, at the stroke of midnight, the snow. it was the national anthem. It's in the snow. <laughs> and the snow, like when your cable goes out. Mm -hmm. So I fell asleep on the living room floor. And I woke up at some point, and uh, it had to be after midnight because the snow was on the TV. And there was a man sitting in a chair backwards at my feet. And he was talking, but to this day, I can't tell you what he was saying. Somebody grabbed my hands, somebody grabbed my feet. There were five of them. I was a virgin. You could pretty much figure out for us. Um, I told my roommate the next day, and she thought it was funny. And I couldn't figure out why she thought it was funny. I found out when I was 16 that they were paying her to bring girls down there so she knew what was going to happen to me before we even left the facility. And when we went back to the facility, she told everybody. So... To the guys, I was easy. To the girls, I was a slut. And to the counselors, I was this traumatized 12-year-old child who had been through something so very traumatic and they wanted to help, but I'm still like numb. You know, I couldn't process any of that in my brain. Um, and they kept pushing me to speak. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm the type of person, if you push me into a corner, I'm gonna come out swinging. And then I'm going to run, because that's what I learned at a young age. To deal with your problems, that's what you do. You run. So I ran. And I was walking the streets, still trying to process all of this bullshit in my brain. And here comes this little Mexican man, about my size. I'm only five foot three. I'm a tiny little itty bitty thing. He was about my size. And he was talking. And I'm ignoring him. And he's still talking. And I couldn't figure out, if I'm not saying nothing to you, why are you still speaking? Finally, he shut up. He grabbed me by the back of the shirt and he pulled me down to the ground. And he attempted what had happened the night before. But something in my head snapped. And my 12-year-old self beat the shit at his 30-year-old man. Ooh. And I did call the police. Did I tell the police about what happened the night before? No, I was still embarrassed and I was still in shock and I was still in all kinds of crazy and whatnot. But I did, and it turned out the cops knew who I was talking about because he had tried this before and nobody ever pressed charges on him. Okay. So they brought me in one police car and they had another police car behind us. We went to his house and as they were bringing him out, I had the idea. And I did. So they cuffed him up and put him in the car. And then it hit me. They're going to bring me to the police station. They're going to make me file an official report. They're going to call my parents because I'm a minor. My mother worked for the city. And my mother was real big on appearances, boy. So, so I knew that this was not going to be a pleasant situation. And my mother walked in. And the cop spoke to her first, and I'm assuming he was telling her what was going on. My mother walked up to me and said, how dare you embarrass this family you got what you deserve because you want to place your shit in the bed. That was dear old mom. And they sent me home with them. And a few days later, we had to go to court for this individual. And in my mom's defense, I think she thought in her head that this was going to be like juvenile court. Juvenile court up north is a closed courtroom. Can't nobody go in the galley except for the defendant, the attorneys, 
and the parents and the judge. My mother walked into the courtroom and saw that it was packed, like absolutely standing room only. The judge had a full docket and she got embarrassed. And so she decided that we were not going to participate, which meant that they had to let him go. Five days later, that very same individual raped and killed a five-year-old little girl. Oh my God. And I carried that little girl's death on my shoulders from the time I was 12 until I got sober at 40. And I blamed my mother for it because she had the power to lock his ass up and didn't. Um, so needless to say, I wasn't getting what I needed at home. Surprise, surprise, I ended up knocked up at 13. What did my mother do? She made us, she took us to Virginia and made us get married. Now I am no longer legally her responsibility. I had baby number one by 14, baby number two by 15, baby number three by 16. And my husband had developed a really nasty crack habit. And at some point I got tired of the ripping and the running and his stealing and his going to jail and rehab and blah, 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 blah. So I decided I wanted a divorce, but I couldn't tell him this because he was in jail and they had him on suicide watch. So one day he calls me and he was like, I got sentenced today. Really? How long? They gave me three years. I'm sorry. I was happy as shit. I knew where he was. I didn't have to worry about him going out and stealing this, that, and the other thing. You know, I didn't have to worry about none of that. So I went upstairs to my room and I was laying on my bed with the feet dangling over the side and I was talking on the phone. And the next thing I hear is, surprise! This son of a bitch is standing at my feet. My first thought was you escaped. They'll be here any minute to collect you. <laughs> <laughs> well, he wanted to surprise me is what the fuck he wanted to do. And I'm pretty sure that he stopped between the the jail and home, he stopped off at the crack man. Of course. Divorce just came lit and out of my mouth. And he did not take that well. I was his wife, therefore I was his property and he could do what he wanted and I couldn't, I didn't have any say so in the matter. So he pinned me to the bed and you can figure out the rest. So this is the person who's supposed to love you. I had a very violent reaction. And the cops came and gave me a choice. We can either take you to jail, we can take you to the living <coughs> bin, or you can leave. So I chose to leave, and the best thing that I could have done for my kids was to leave them with their grandparents. Because I would have fucked their lives up the way I did with my youngest ones, for real. So now, I'm almost 17 years old. I have no real responsibilities. I get a job in a nightclub. A Spanish nightclub at that. <laughs> and I didn't mind you know alcohol was normal in my family so I didn't mind the booze what bothered me was the hangovers and one night I guess I was looking extra extra rough extra crispy and shit <laughs> and a friend of mine came in and he slid this little silver packet across the bar he said take that in the bathroom do a couple of bumps of that and you'll be fine I did and I was I realized by the time I was 17 and a half that the more cocaine that went up my nose, the more alcohol I, should, I could drink. So ultimately, I became a junkie just to feed my alcoholism. Um, and that was my life for many years. You know, I partied and that's, that's all I fucking did. And to me, it was normal. You know, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm paying my bills. Why can't I do what the fuck I want to do? I discovered after hours, God help me. Mm. And this was my life, but there was always, I always felt different. And I couldn't put a finger on why I felt different. Um, and there was something always missing. So then I met baby daddy number two. And with him, I thought I hit the lottery. He was tall, dark, handsome, Latin, and he had a job. He was real charming at first, like most Latin men are. But then he started to get possessive. And he started telling me what I could and couldn't wear, who I could and couldn't talk to, where I could and couldn't go. 
Um, and then he started with the smacks and the stitches. And then the smacks turned into punches and the bruises and the broken bones. And when I got pregnant, I thought that the beatings would stop. They didn't. He pushed me down on my tailbone. I was about five and a half months pregnant. He pushed me and I landed on my tailbone. And uh, I went to the doctor the next day and I had an ultrasound done. And they said, we think you may have to abort this child because we don't think the baby is growing. I was like, that's some bullshit. I got an appointment with my doctor in exactly 10 days. I, I ain't listening to nothing y'all motherfuckers gotta say. And I waited that 10 days to go see my doctor. And he couldn't find a heartbeat either. So I basically carried around a dead fetus for 10 days. Mm. And he told me that I had to be admitted because they had to take her from me. Now, how broken was I that this son of a bitch ultimately killed my daughter and I stayed with him? That is how broken I was. And then I got pregnant again. And this baby was born three and a half months early for the same reason. Only he, he fought. My son is a fighter. And he survived. Uh, then one night, for no particular reason, I was laying on the bed watching TV. He was sitting across the room watching TV and stuffing down his dinner and whatnot. And for no in particular reason at all, it was like an out-of-body experience. I got up. I crossed the room. I went behind the couch. I took the belt off my robe. And I tried to strangle this son of a bitch. Mm. I don't know what happened after that because I woke up on the bed with a hole in my chin and he was gone. But I knew right then and there that one of us had to leave because one of us was gonna die. So I left and here and now I got this little itty bitty premature baby that I have to take care of. And I had no job experience and no real education. What do I do? I went back to doing what I knew. You know, and then I went to work at a strip club. And it wasn't too long, too long before I ended up on the pole. <laughs> and at first, it was okay. I was paying the bills and I was taking care of the baby. But then the disease kicked in. And I was picking him up later and later and later and later from the babysitters and coming up with all these different kind of excuses. And he started to be an inconvenience when it came to my party. And when I tell you that my addiction raised my son, I didn't, my addiction did. At five years old, he was pushing a chair up to the stove to make mommy chicken soup because mommy was always sick. You know, I used to live above a bar and if I couldn't find a babysitter to watch him, NyQuil became my babysitter. And I didn't think anything of it. It's crazy the shit an alcoholic and an addict can justify. I saw nothing wrong with this. He's got a roof over his head, he's got clothes on his back, he's got stomach, you know, food in his stomach. I'm the mother of the year. And that's how his entire life went. And that's how my life went. Everything was one big party. And nobody ever confronted me that I might quite possibly be slightly out of control. My disease was the elephant in the room that nobody wanted to talk about. They would bitch amongst each other, but they would never confront me. So I genuinely didn't think I had a problem. Um, in 2003, I went down to Alabama for my, son's, my oldest son's high school graduation. <coughs> and when you're coming from like New York and New Jersey, there is a peace in Alabama that you can't find anywhere. And it, it was Ohatchee, Alabama. One red light in the whole damn town. <laughs> so I got a little squirrely after about a year. And my mother-in-law decided she wanted to move to Jacksonville, Florida so that she could be closer to her son, who was a JSO here. <laughs> and my house became party central to all the neighborhood kids, like from 15 up. And I justified it. Well, they're not running the streets and they're not getting in there. I turned into my mother. And I was always in the clubs and I was always partying and I was always bringing people home. You know, when the club closed, the club came home with me. And I now know the reason I did that was because I could not stomach being alone with myself. I was full of so much self-loathing. It was ridiculous. 
Uh, you remember I said I felt different, but I couldn't put a finger on it? I had to move 1,500 miles away from everybody that I loved and knew to be able to come out of the closet. That's what was wrong. I was lying to myself for decades. And I just couldn't live that lie. So I came down here to leap out of the closet. <laughs> I didn't tippy-toe, I leaped. And um, in 2008, me and my ex broke up and I met an amazing woman and we were friends for the first year. And um, for those of y'all yeah, who don't know, my wife is sitting in the front row. Um, she knew I was a raging alcoholic from the minute she set her eyes on me. And she chose to stay. I didn't love get her. It. <laughs> uh, we got married in. No, wait, let me back up. When Anthony was 14, I'm sorry, I came home from the club. And I was loud and obnoxious. You know how us drunks are. We just don't give a fuck. We're just really, really loud and really, really obnoxious, and we just don't care. And I woke him up, and he had every right to be pissed off, but of course I didn't see it that way then. And he put me into what I can only call a drug and alcohol-induced rage. And I picked my, my child, my, mind you, he was a preemie. He was two pounds when he was born. So he's about my size. I picked him up like a battering ram that the cops bust the door down, doors down with, and I tried to throw my child out of a second story window. Mm -hmm. And you would think as a mother that would have been my bottom. It wasn't. I kept drinking for a few more years. Um, now, back to the wifey. We got married in 2009. This was my third and final marriage. It was her first. Should have been the most amazing fucking experience of her life, right? I don't remember my wedding night because I decided after the reception I wanted to go to the bar and celebrate. They, somebody got pictures of me shooting pool in my wedding dress, like for real. I remember doing the first shot. I don't remember leaving the club. And she never said a word to me. I'd have been out of there. <laughs> That's right. I, I'd have been. I'm gone. Um... But she didn't, she didn't go anywhere, and I love her to pieces. I'm so fucking grateful for her, for her. And by this point, I was an entertainer. My ex introduced me to the wonderful world of drag. And I did male illusion for 10 years. But my drinking got out of hand, and nobody wanted to book me. Nobody wanted to perform with me. It was ruining my reputation as an entertainer. And it's really kind of hard to get that back once you, you destroy it. Can I have my coffee, honey, please? Thank you. Um, we had a big show down in Daytona called Gay Days. And Gay Days is the biggest gay and lesbian uh, event in the whole entire state of Florida. <laughs> my wife will tell you it was not my last drunk, but it was my worst drunk. And that says a lot. Um, I started drinking at about 11 o'clock in the morning. And I was co-owner of the group that was performing. Setting a lovely example. Um, I was a blackout drunk. And that became convenient for me. If I don't remember it, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I lived that way for many, 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 many years. So um, it was that drunk, though, who brought me into these rooms. And I came in angry as hell. I didn't understand any of y'all. Y'all just made no sense to me. You're talking about all this tragic shit and you're laughing and what the fuck is funny? I don't understand. I threw the big book across the table and said this shit reads like Japanese arithmetic. Like I was angry. I was very, very dry for 44 days. <coughs> I performed in a, a friend's wedding in Georgia. And uh, I relapsed. Again, don't remember none of it. I know I went on a nine and a half hour binge. And I woke up the next morning at a friend's house. And they came out and so, what happened last night? Well, you know, Time. I go to these meetings and I listen to these people talk about all this tragic shit. I don't think I hit a bottom. 
She said, no. She grabbed me by the arm, dragged me in the house, threw me down on the couch and turned on the TV. If it wasn't for the tattoos on my neck, I would not have recognized the person on the screen. My face was swollen from all the alcohol that I had consumed in nine and a half hours. My hands were swollen. I could not hold myself up in a sitting position. It was like Jekyll and Hyde meet Sybil. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not what got me. You would think my appearance, and no, it's just another drunk night. What got me was somebody in the video asked me who my wife was or where my wife was. She's holding me up, we're forehead to forehead. And I looked her dead in the face and said, I don't fucking know. It was the look of hurt and devastation on her face that did it for me. Because I decided right then and there that I never wanted to be the person to put that look on that woman's face ever again. And I think it was at that exact moment that I unofficially did step one. I came back into these rooms 10 days later. You know, I had to wait 10 days because I was the only person in the world who had ever relapsed. And I was in balance. Nobody would understand. I walked in here with the gift, of, the gift of desperation. And my attitude was like, okay, I'm broke. How do y'all fix me? And I never looked back. Steps two and three were the hardest for me. You know, for a lot of people, it's four and five. Steps two and three, because I am also a recovering Catholic. <laughs> and my mother always used to use religion to try to fix me and try to scare the shit out of me, quite frankly. Um, and I was mad. God was the first person on my resentment list when I did my course. <coughs> you know, he let me get raped he, multiple times. Not just once, but multiple times. He let me get beat. He took my father. He took my daughter. And you want me to do what? <laughs> nah, you, you had a younger one, mine. Mm, no. Uh, and I told my sponsor, I will do every single one of those except for those two. I can't do that. Can't so do a friend rest. of mine said to me one day, he was like, you know, Brooklyn, you ever notice how it says higher power of your own understanding? And then he explained to me what that meant. Mm -hmm. And I was like, er? So he said, you can borrow my higher power. Mm -hmm. I borrowed it. I just chose to keep it. I refer to my higher power as Gus, the guy upstairs. I don't drop to my knees to pray to Gus. I have conversations with Gus. Lots of them. You know, and that's worked for me for 14 years. You know, me, me and Gus are buddies. <laughs> um, four I walked into with ego. Rolling up my sleeves talking about, this is going to be a piece of cake. I didn't hurt nobody. I didn't do nothing. I was always the victim. Watch, everybody's always hurting me. Man, listen, nine hours of writing. And then I held it up and I was like, oh, I couldn't stomach myself. <laughs> you know, I was selfish, self-centered, egotistical, damn near narcissistic. I didn't care who I hurt. I used to hurt people. On, oh my God, no, you didn't do the blaming. I love you. I'm sorry. Um, so I walked into four with ego, and five was fairly easy for me because my sponsor's story makes my story sound like a bedtime story, and my sponsor is crazier than I am. So doing five with him, right? He is crazy. Um, doing five with him was just like having a regular conversation. And just when I think I was going to say something that was going to shock him, he looked at me like, and? Okay, let's keep this moving. Um, six, I didn't know what to make of. I didn't think I had any character defects. <laughs> <laughs> and the few that I did have, I didn't want to get rid of them. I didn't want to get rid of my anger. My anger, my whole entire life was a defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, because I never express any feel. You know how us Latin women are. We don't show feelings. Until it's, it's too late. Do. Until it's too late. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, but anger was always my defense mechanism. If you hurt me, I was going to get pissed off. If, if, 
You made me happy I was going to get pissed off. I just didn't see the need to get rid of my anger. Um, my pride and my ego I didn't want to get rid of either because that was the only thing that would convince me that I was worth anything. You know, even if it was false pride, it was still my false pride. And I wrote down all my character defects. And then Seven kind of got me screwed up a little bit because if you read Seven, it says... Um, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. So I'm thinking, I'm going to ask us to remove my shortcomings, and I'm going to wake up the next morning, and poof, I'm going to be, you know, pure as a driven snow. <laughs> Guess what? It doesn't work like that. We have to work on our own character defects, and it's a lifetime thing. You know, so I was like, damn, more work? Why am I going to put in more work? I put in enough work. I don't want to do no more work. When does it start to get easy? But little by little, I, my attitude started to change. My perspective started to change. I started to change and didn't even realize it. Other people noticed it before I did. And I was slowly becoming a much nicer person. Huda, thank you. You know, I teach anger management now. And I teach the dangers of anger and resentment in recovery now. Which, to me, I find funny as hell. If you would have known me before, you'd know why that was funny. Um, so, eight... Unprofessional, no, more one, more one, more one. Made a list of all person arms. I didn't want to do eight because I didn't want to think about all the people that I hurt. And doing nine, I came around and doing nine really wasn't all that difficult for me, except for two people, my wife and my son. I did not know how to make amends to them because I pretty much destroyed them during the end of my drinking career. Six years into my sobriety, I was still trying to figure out how to make amends to this woman. And then I realized one day, it just sort of kind of hit me, I realized I'm trying to make her forget. I'm never going to be able to make her forget that, no matter how hard I try. So instead what I did was I threw her a surprise birthday party that turned into a surprise proposal that turned into a surprise wedding. I gave her a new memory. My son, on the other hand, this was his whole life. And he got out of prison and um, he started feeling a little froggy. Instead of calling his sponsor, he called me. And that's when I realized my sobriety is my amends to him. It took me 32 years after giving birth to this child for me to become the mother that he deserved. Now, unfortunately, he's back in jail again but I'm still gonna be sober mom, sober supportive mom, who will still stick her foot in his ass when he needs it. Um, 10, 11, and 12 is a daily thing for me, and it really is. I live by these steps and by this program. When I first came in here, you know you got all these little cliches up on the wall one day at a time, live and let live, first things first. The one saying that got on my nerves more than anything was when somebody said, it is what it is. I wanted to literally jump over the table and throw punch them. And that's not me exaggerating, that's me being dead ass. <laughs> but I live by those words today. And it comes out of my mouth quite frequently. In fact, I have five shirts, five different shirts that say it is what it is. And a hat. Let's not forget the hat. You know, because I literally live by, that's how I get through, you know, the first three steps, save my ass. And in spite of the years that I have under my belt, um, I'm always going to be an alcoholic and an addict. And this program is always going to help me with that. But for the past couple of years, it's been less about my addiction because my um, obsession has been removed. And it's been more about learning how to live life on life's terms. And let me tell you, for me, that's harder than uh, getting clean and sober. That was a, it's a lot harder for me to learn how to live life on life's terms. And it's like, I don't want to adult. Who the hell wants to adult? I'm not a fan. That's the worst idea ever. <laughs> I call my sponsor up all the time and be like, this shit sucks. I don't want to do this no more. I want to go back to being a little kid. But then again, I don't because I don't want to go back to being the person that I was. 
So living life on life's terms has definitely, while it's been challenging, more so the last couple of years, um, the whole entire time that I'm going through shit and shit's hitting the fan, I'm not even thinking about a drug or a drink. And for me, that's a miracle. You know, because I used to drink for any reason. Happy, let's get fucked up. Mad, let's get fucked up. Sad, let's get fucked up. Like, I... It's Tuesday. I should have known that I was an alcoholic when I started drinking Cisco like it was water. Yeah. Whose stomach just went thump, thump, thump? <laughs> <laughs> It's an acquired taste. So I live by these, by this program. I make recovery videos. I write recovery blogs to try to help the next person. And I post them open on, on Facebook. I don't maintain my own anonymity because when I was performing, I made my disease very public. So it made no sense to me to hide behind anonymity now that I'm getting sober. So I, I do these, I teach those two classes in a local rehab. And I have been since I was a year sober. You know, this is definitely a way of life. And I never forget that regardless of how much time I have under my belt, all I really have is today. And the one thing that I learned in the past couple of years especially is that I'm 14 years and four months clean and sober and I still don't know shit and I'm okay with that. <laughs> so that was my little twisted story. I done.